On December 15, 2022, 11-year-old Madalena Kojakari was reported missing in Cornelius, North Carolina. Her mother, Diana Kojakari, initially told police that she last saw her daughter on the night of November 23rd. However, investigators soon discovered that nobody outside the family had seen Madalena after November 21st. This discrepancy raised suspicions, especially as it became apparent that Diana, along with her husband Christopher Palmiter, were withholding crucial information, impeding the progress of the investigation. Now, a year and a half later, Madalena remains missing, and investigators are still searching for her. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve the case. So if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. Okay, so Madalena Kojakari. I'm not going to spend too much time on this open because this isn't really a whodunit. Yes, there's always mystery in every case that's unsolved, but with this one, I feel like we know, for the most part, the who. We just don't understand the why or the how, which are equally important, especially if we want to find Madalena. Now, why did this case resonate with me? Well, a couple of reasons. First off, it's relatively new. It's still very active. And if we're going to be able to do anything with this case, now is the time. And because this involves a child that's currently missing, time is still of the essence. And listen, I've worked a lot of different cases as a detective, as a private investigator, and I've also covered a lot of cases on Crime Weekly and now here on Detective Perspective. And I will tell you that the hardest cases for me to cover, and I've said this before, are cases involving children. And I can't help but be human and be a dad here. And as many of you know, I have two young daughters. Uh, one of them is 11 years old. So hearing about a case like this and then also seeing a video of Madalena right before she went missing, the last sighting we have of her, I can't help but think about my own daughter. And, and how I would feel if this happened to me. And it's without a doubt my worst nightmare. And even though I may not be able to solve this case on my own, I can use my platform to share information about this investigation in the hopes that one of you out there may be able to help solve this case and bring Madalena home. So with that all out of the way, let's dive into this week's case. Madalena Kojakari was born on April 11, 2011 to her mother, Diana Kojakari. Now, unfortunately, we don't know much about Madalena's background except that she loves horses, playing games, the outdoors, and spending time with her friends. At some point, Diana married a man by the name of Christopher Palmiter, and he became Madalena's stepfather. They all settled into a home at 18413 Victoria Bay Drive in Cornelius, North Carolina. By the fall of 2022, Madalena was 11 years old and a sixth grade student at Bailey Middle School in Cornelius. On November 21st, she went to school like normal. The next day, Thanksgiving break began. But when school started again, Madalena didn't show up. The school tried to contact Diana multiple times, but she didn't reply. Police documents report that on December 12th, a Bailey Middle School counselor and a resource officer visited the Kojakari home to see what was going on, but no one answered the door, so they left a truancy packet. Two days later, on December 14th, the counselor called Diana and requested a meeting to discuss Madalena's absences. Diana said she would bring Madalena to school the next day and they would discuss everything. But when Diana arrived on the 15th, Madalena was not with her. This was obviously concerning, so the counselor asked the school resource officer to come in. At that time, Diana revealed that she hadn't seen Madalena since November 23rd at around 10 p.m. when Madalena went to bed. Diana mentioned that she and her husband Chris argued that night. 
The next morning would have been the 24th, and Chris drove to his family's house in Michigan to, quote, recover some items. At around 11.30 a.m., Diana checked on Madalena and realized she wasn't in her room. However, according to police documents, Diana didn't contact Chris to ask if he knew where Madalena was. She also didn't call the police. Instead, she waited until Chris got home around 7 p.m. on the 26th to ask if he knew where Madalena was, and he claimed that he didn't. When the school counselor and resource officer asked Diana why she didn't report Madalena missing, she said she was worried it would cause a, quote, conflict between her and Chris. The resource officer then suggested Diana call Chris and ask him to join the meeting. The officer also requested two detectives to respond as well. When the detectives arrived, they interviewed Chris, and he explained that on November 23rd, he went to Michigan to pick up some items. He mentioned that he didn't see Madalena the day he left, and he thought the last time he saw her was a week before his trip. Chris said when he returned home on the 26th, he asked Diana where Madalena was, but she claimed she didn't know. He then asked Diana if she had hidden Madalena, and she again said no. In response, she also asked him the same question, and he denied hiding Madalena as well. According to Chris, in the following weeks, he repeatedly asked Diana about Madalena, but she always said she didn't know where she was. Police documents state that the detectives also spoke to Diana. She explained that Madalena didn't have a phone and that her backpack and some clothes were missing from the house as well. She added that Madalena didn't have any local friends she could be staying with and that they didn't have any local family due to Diana being from the Eastern European country of Moldova. Diana told detectives that she believed Chris might have put her family in danger, but she didn't elaborate any further, insisting that she had no knowledge of what happened to Madalena. Diana further mentioned that she had contacted her family in Moldova for advice and they had told her to contact the police, but she was hesitant. After interviewing both Diana and Chris, the detectives visited the Kojakari house to search Madalena's room. She was obviously nowhere to be found, neither in her room or anywhere else in the house, and again, both Diana and Chris insisted they had no idea where she could be. Now, according to police documents, while inside, the detectives noticed a section of the kitchen blocked off with plywood. They asked about it, and Chris explained that they were planning to build a separate apartment there, but there's no elaboration on what that actually entailed. Later that evening, the detectives returned to the house with a search warrant. They ended up seizing multiple items during the search, including Diana and Chris's cell phones. So what I think happened here is initially, the detectives went to the house to ensure that Madalena wasn't there. It's a long shot, but there have been cases where detectives take the word of the parents, they conduct this huge search, and then ultimately they find that the child was hiding somewhere in the house. So you want to start there. And what I think happened is they had consent to go into the home. Diana and Chris probably invited them in. And then as they started to look around, they thought to themselves, hmm, there may be some things here that we want to take. And we don't want to tip them off before we have a chance to grab those items. And yes, technically with a consent to search, just a verbal consent to search, you could take those items and they more than likely would be admissible in court. But what's even better than that is a signed search warrant for from a judge. And that's what they decided to do. So they probably left that scene making Diana and Chris feel comfortable. And then they went and got the warrant and came back and surprised them and said, hey, by the way, we're taking your phones. And that way they ensure that more than likely Diana and Chris were not tipped off and therefore deleted any type of forensic evidence on their phones or in the house that would be of value later on, which I think is a great move by the investigators. And they were probably looking for any signs of a struggle that would suggest something actually happened to Madalena in the home or anything that would implicate Chris or Diana and Madalena's disappearance. Now, before we continue on, let's take a quick break. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. As I just mentioned, these sheets are infused with silver, allowing them to prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them staying cleaner and fresher three times longer than your other sheets. And not only are these sheets packed with science, they're also luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands, and they feel just as nice, if not nicer, than the sheets used in some five-star hotels. 
Miracle Made sheets are designed for your skin, so stop sleeping on bacteria because, as we know, bacteria can clog your pores, causing more breakouts and acne. And who wants that? So, if you want to sleep clean with Miracle, go to trymiracle.com/detective to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use my promo code Detective at checkout, you'll also get three free towels and save an additional 20%. Miracle is so confident in their products, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made today and go to trymiracle.com slash detective and use code detective to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Thanks to Miracle Made for sponsoring this week's episode. Let's get back to the case. So after searching the Kojikari home, the Cornelius police brought in the FBI and the State Bureau of Investigation, also known as the SBI. On December 16th, the FBI issued a missing persons poster for Madalena. The following day on December 17th, Chris and Diana were arrested and charged with failure to report the disappearance of a child to law enforcement. Both pleaded not guilty. According to the Charlotte Observer, during Diana's initial hearing, the prosecutor told the judge that Diana reported Madalena missing reluctantly and had impeded the investigation into her disappearance. The prosecutor expressed concerns that if Diana were to be released on bail, she might continue to obstruct the investigation. Diana's bond was set at $250,000, while Chris's was set at $200,000. Now, while the couple sat in jail, the police focused on figuring out the last time anyone other than Chris and Diana had seen Madalena. They eventually found out that she was last seen getting off the school bus near her home on November 21st. On December 20th, five days after the police realized Madalena was missing, they released video footage of Madalena exiting the bus. They told the public that they were looking for witnesses outside of the family to narrow down the exact time she disappeared. The Cornelius police then displayed banners and missing person posters outside the police department to remind people about Madalena's disappearance. They also frequently posted on social media, urging people to share Madalena's story. On December 22nd, the police released a letter written by an unidentified extended family member of Madalena's. The letter expressed the family's sadness and shock over Madalena's disappearance. They said they were doing everything they could to find her and bring her home, and they asked everyone to share her poster and call in tips. By December 28th, investigators had searched various places around the city and state, gone door-to-door -door at more than 245 homes in the area, and pursued over 250 leads worldwide. A Cornelius police captain told the media, quote, This is a serious case of a child whose parents clearly are not telling us everything they know. By early January 2023, the police had received information suggesting Diana might have been in Madison County, North Carolina, after Madalena was last seen and before she was reported missing. They urged anyone who saw her in that area between November 22nd and December 15th to come forward. On April 11th, Madalena turned 12 years old. The Cornelius Police Department held a vigil to remind everyone that she was still missing. At the vigil, the Cornelius Police Chief said, quote, Madalena is an energetic, vibrant 12-year-old girl who loves animals and specifically loves horses. A child in our community is missing and we need your help to find her. Now, obviously, I love this. I love that the police department is going beyond what they're required to do. Yes, they're in charge of finding Madalena. But as I said at the top of the show, many of these men and women who work in this police department are fathers and mothers. And I'm sure just like myself, they can't help but see their own child when they look at Madalena. So it, it takes on a different role for them. And as much as we try to keep investigations objective and not personal, as a parent, that's extremely hard to do. And I think in this case where it doesn't feel like Madalena's parents are fighting for her, they know that someone has to. Someone has to keep her name alive, and that's what they're doing here. And I really respect it, and I really appreciate it. Now, a few days after the vigil, the Charlotte Observer revealed that on November 30th, a few weeks before Madalena was reported missing, police responded to a call at the Kojikari household. Neighbors had contacted the police that afternoon to say that Diana was burning furniture in the backyard. When officers arrived, they discovered Diana burning items, but unfortunately, no further details about this incident have been disclosed. In July, several new documents were released, which provided the public with a lot of new information. So let's walk through that now. 
According to these documents, when the police went through Diana's phone, they found a text from December 2nd where Diana mentioned she was with Madalena. This caught their eye because if you remember, Diana claimed the last time she saw her daughter was on November 23rd. On that same day, Diana had, quote, extensive communication with a distant relative. The police interviewed the relative, who mentioned that Diana and her mother asked if he would help Diana, quote, smuggle herself and Madalena away from their home. Diana went on to say that she was in a bad relationship with Chris and wanted a divorce. When investigators looked into this relative's phone records, they found several calls to numbers linked to ongoing drug investigations, and a warrant suggested a possible connection between the narcotics activity and, quote, human smuggling. So to give you a quick overview here, when we're doing a narcotics investigation, especially if it's a multi-jurisdictional operation, what we will normally do is enter any phone numbers that are coming up during our wiretaps into a database. And that's done for multiple reasons, obviously to document what we're seeing, what we're hearing, but also it's used for what's called deconfliction. So if another agency starts a drug investigation and they start to pop up similar numbers, it will notify them of existing agencies who are already working that case and have already identified those specific numbers. So more than likely, when they started entering this information into a database, um, having the FBI involved already, they probably pulled together their resources and noticed that some of the numbers coming up on this relative's records were also linked to ongoing investigations that were being conducted by either the FBI or maybe even the DEA. Now, as far as this human smuggling element, yes, whenever drugs are involved, you're going to find a lot of other crimes. In my experience, where there's drugs, there's going to be robberies, there's going to be larcenies, there's going to be sexual assaults, there can obviously be human trafficking, there can be murder. So yes, it's not a far-fetched to, to see, hey, listen, there's a, a large amount of narcotics activity going on here, there may be some human smuggling as well. And maybe due to multiple investigations that were being conducted, and again, when they put these numbers into the database, yes, it might have flagged something on the DEA end, but it also could have flagged something on the FBI or ATF where they said, hey, listen, same number being found in multiple investigations, one with narcotics, one with human trafficking. Either way, this is not a good thing when you're trying to find an 11-year-old girl. Now, after learning about all this information, Diana's car, a green 2008 Toyota Prius, was seized as evidence. When police brought in a canine to search the vehicle, the dog alerted to the scent of narcotics. The rest of the car was also searched, and in the center console, investigators found Madalena's Moldovan and Romanian passports, Diana's Romanian passport, a Moldovan debit card, and miscellaneous education and work documents. According to police documents, investigators continued looking into Diana's whereabouts around December 2nd, and they learned that on December 3rd, she was seen at a service station in Hickory, North Carolina, getting an oil change on her car. The service attendant told police that there were children's toys in the car, but Madalena was not with Diana. The police were able to further determine that on December 4th, Diana traveled toward, quote, the North Carolina mountains, claiming to be searching for Madalena. Now, the documents did not specify which mountains she was heading to. Now, after all of this took place, the Sugar Mountain Police Department obtained surveillance photographs of a man and a young female in the area on December 16th. According to police documents, the young girl in the images was physically consistent with Madalena, while the man looked like the relative that Diana had been talking on the phone with on December 2nd. Also on December 16th, Chris sent a message via Facebook acknowledging the family was, quote, in some kind of investigation. He said Madalena was missing and the police took all of their electronics except for an old phone and his personal computer. Chris said he believed the police overlooked the computer, which Diana was using to call her parents. The following day, Chris and Diana were arrested. Now, you may think this is where this story ends, but we're just getting started. There's still a lot of information to cover, so we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. The summer is right around the corner and it's time to get those beach bodies ready, so fuel up with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for the summer thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factors fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy a nutritious, great tasting meal. With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. 
And if you want some recommendations, I strongly recommend checking out the strawberry banana smoothie or the bacon and smoked cheddar egg bites. Those are definitely my go-tos right now. And listen, just because the meals are ready fast, it doesn't mean that the quality isn't there. You can treat yourself to restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. And one of the main reasons I love Factor so much, other than the food tasting great, is that it can support whatever lifestyle you have, even if that changes for you over time. You can choose from six menu preferences to help you manage calories, maximize protein intake, avoid meat, or simply eat a well-balanced meal. Whatever you need, Factor's got you covered. I've been eating Factor for years now. I don't intend on stopping anytime soon, and I've mentioned it numerous times that right now, I'm really changing over my body. I'm trying to build up my protein intake while also losing weight, and that means I have to count macros. Factor takes out all the guesswork for you. I still get to eat something that I really enjoy, but I'm also able to stay within the budget that I've set for myself regarding calories. So if you like what you hear and you want to give Factor a try, which I strongly recommend that you do, head on over to factormeals.com detective50 and use my code detective50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. Once again, that's code detective50 at factormeals.com detective50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Thanks to Factor for being part of the episode. Let's get back to the case. In the newly released documents, it was revealed that the police had been listening to Chris and Diana's phone calls from jail. In one call between Chris, his brother, and his sister-in-law, Chris mentioned that before their arrests, Diana had a lot of cash with her and he didn't know where it came from. Chris also mentioned, quote, financial stuff coming up, but his brother reassured him not to worry about it. During a call between Diana and her mother, the woman discussed a bag of money, withdrawing cash, and a theory that Chris sold Madalena for money. The new documents also revealed that the police had placed a confidential informant in Chris's cell. This informant told police that Chris frequently wrote in a journal. When the informant checked the journal, he found out that Chris was recalling Madalena's disappearance and everything he could remember about it. The police later confiscated this journal, but no further details about what it contained have been released. Additionally, documents filed by Chris's attorneys revealed that while Chris was incarcerated, he, his lawyer, an SBI agent, and an FBI agent held a meeting. They discussed audio recordings indicating that Diana, quote, had a plan that didn't involve Chris, along with text messages that implied Diana's intentions to conceal Madalena from everyone, including Chris, without his knowledge. This marked the end of the new information provided, and shortly after its release, the police stated that the sightings of the man and young girl on December 16th were not, in fact, Madalena or the relative. They emphasized that the last confirmed sighting of Madalena was, in fact, when she got off the bus on November 21st. In August, Diana and Chris attended court hearings, and according to the Charlotte Observer, during Diana's hearing, her public defender mentioned that the prosecutors hadn't offered her a deal. At Chris's hearing, his attorney stated that Chris believes Madalena is being cared for by someone Diana, quote, assigned. At this hearing, Chris's bond was reduced from $200,000 to $25,000. He then posted bond and was released, while Diana remained in jail on $250,000 bond. So obviously, I don't know what's going on behind closed doors with these meetings involving these cases. But if I had to take an educated guess, what I would say, first off, bond is to ensure that someone will show up for their court appearance. And if you're a flight risk, that, that bond or bail will be higher. So in Diana's case, we've pointed out through this entire episode, she has friends and family through outside the country, and it would be pretty easy for her to probably get out of the country if she wanted to, especially if she has the financial resources. So they're setting this bond to ensure that she doesn't flee the country and that she shows up for her next court appearance. With Chris, on the other hand, he's from the United States. His family lives in Michigan, and, and it appears from what we've gathered so far he has been very cooperative with not only local police, but also federal agencies. So there's probably multiple factors uh, at play here, and that more than likely explains the reduction in his bond while hers stayed the same. December 15th came and marked one year since Madalena was reported missing. The Cornelius police chief told WCNC that the investigation was still active and ongoing. He encouraged people to share Madalena's photo and submit tips. He said, quote, 
We have poured our hearts and soul into this investigation over the past 12 months, and our goal is to find Madalena, and we are not going to stop until we do. I do believe Madalena is still out there, and someone has the information we need to help find her. On April 11, 2024, the Cornelius police held a vigil to celebrate Madalena's 13th birthday. During the event, they set up a special birthday box in their lobby for community members so they could share their heartfelt wishes for Madalena. Now, the next major update in this case came just a few days ago on May 20th, when Madalena's mother Diana made the surprise decision to plead guilty to failing to report her daughter missing. She was sentenced to 6 to 17 months, but was released from jail as she had already served her sentence while awaiting trial. As she was being released, reporters asked Diana if Madalena was safe, and all she would say was, quote, I hope so. Now, because Diana is not an American citizen, it's very likely that she'll be deported back to her home country of Moldova. And unfortunately, Moldova does not have an extradition treaty with the U.S., meaning if she's deported or leaves on her own, it would be very difficult to bring her back to the States if more charges are filed. On May 21st, jury selection for Chris's trial started, and during the same time, WCNC obtained new court documents including a summarized conversation the FBI had with Diana's cousin. The summary notes that Diana told her cousin she was in danger from a third party, not her husband Chris, and that she and Madalena needed to find safety. Diana mentioned that her plans to stay with Chris's family in Michigan had fallen through. She also stated that she needed help to leave Chris and that a medical excuse she provided to Madalena's school was about to expire. The interview summary also indicates that Diana's cousin had been communicating with Diana's mother, who was allegedly conspiring with Diana to help her and Madalena flee the country. The document states that Diana's cousin urged her to contact the police, but she refused. Diana said she had enough money to live for two to three months and was sending large sums of money overseas. Now, at the time of recording this episode, Chris's trial is ongoing, but if there's any significant updates, I'll be sure to keep you guys posted. Unfortunately, despite these updates, Madalena remains missing, and the Cornelius police, SBI, and FBI continue to investigate her disappearance. They won't give up until they bring her home where she belongs. All right, let's dive into the perspective, and I think we can go right through this one. And although it's not 100% certainty, I think it's highly likely that this was not an abduction or a kidnapping by someone unknown to Madalena. You always got to qualify and say, yeah, it's a possibility, but based on everything we know, it doesn't appear to be the case, which is a good thing. So we talked about it through the episode as far as what's involved here. Narcotics, large sums of money, potential human trafficking, all that's at play. And I, I think there's a few different scenarios that could have taken place here. And we can go through the different scenarios, starting with the one that I feel is least likely to the one that I feel is most plausible. And real quickly, before I go through these theories, I just want to mention, we didn't omit Madalena's father intentionally. I don't know if he's deceased or just no longer in the picture, but from everything we've seen from all the court documents released, he is not on law enforcement's radar, and I'm sure that's for a specific reason. Unknown to me, but again, for anyone saying could the father have taken her, it doesn't appear to be a, a viable scenario. So now for the first and, and most unlikely scenario, and that's that Madalena was sold into some type of human trafficking organization because either Diana or Chris wanted money or they had to pay off a debt. Based on everything that's been done with this case, there's no indication through text messages or phone conversations that that was the situation that either of them were hurting for cash. It appears Diana had plenty of it. And there doesn't appear to be any correspondence that's saying, hey, this is what we're thinking. It's more along the lines of, we have to get Madalena out of here. So unless that was code for something, it doesn't seem like the motive behind Madalena's disappearance. The second scenario, which I guess is, is possible and we have to acknowledge it, is that something happened to Madalena in the household. She was severely injured or killed at the hands of Diana or Chris or both. And you could have a situation where she was hurt and the next day, She's brought up to Michigan with Chris. That's his, you know, his visit to go pick up some things. And, you know, they disposed of her body there. But that doesn't appear to be the case, fortunately, because you would expect to find some type of forensic evidence in the home that would suggest a severe injury to Madalena that was cleaned up after the fact. I'm sure 
that detectives went through that house with a fine tooth comb, including luminol tests to see if blood had been wiped up from any uh, areas in the house. And I would assume based on what we know, that was not the case. Additionally, you have text messages with Diana alleging that she was with Madalena well after Chris went to Michigan. So it doesn't appear that something abrupt happened. And I would definitely expect to see more forensic evidence. And I'm glad that this doesn't look like the likely scenario because this would this is not the outcome we're looking for. We want to find Madalena alive and well. Which brings me to my final scenario, which I do think is the most likely. I don't know the why. I don't know what Diana and or Chris were tied up in. But clearly there was something going on here. That's not my words. That's Diana's words. They they were in trouble from some individual or organization that we're currently not aware of. And Diana was clearly trying to flee the country with her daughter without Chris. So I think it might have been a combination of things. There was some issues going on financially or with some type of criminal activity they were involved in. And Diana was killing two birds with one stone. She was getting away from whatever she was in fear of while also leaving a man that she was no longer in love with. And what more than likely happened is during the execution of this plan, for some reason, Diana wasn't able to get out. I don't know why that would be. Only she would know. But Madalena is probably with someone, I'm guessing, still in the country because, as I mentioned, Madalena's passport was found in Diana's vehicle. So unless they went through some illegal back channels, Madalena very well may still be in the States. And that's not a stretch when you think about the fact that it appears Diana had some money and she also had some connections through her family members and distant relatives. So it may not be someone she's directly connected to, but someone that her relatives are, which is why there's this blind spot for law enforcement where they're not able to connect the dots. And this would definitely explain the unreasonable behavior of a parent after their child went missing. Why would she be so cagey with the school and with the resource officer? Why would she just basically sound like she has no clue what's going on? Very flippant about the whole thing. Well, maybe she's trying to throw everyone off the tracks. So I just want to leave you guys with that, that yes, on the surface, Diana does not look great. And that, and we, that may be the road we eventually end at. However, there's also a scenario where there was a danger to her and her child. And again, it may have been self-inflicted, but either way, in an attempt to protect her child, she sent Madalena somewhere else, knowing that she wouldn't be able to see her for a while. So you could be looking at a situation here when we finally get the whole picture that Madalena was sent away not because Diana didn't want her, but because she loved her and she wanted to protect her. But ultimately, I do agree with law enforcement. Someone out there absolutely knows what happened to Madalena. And who knows, maybe one of you out there have even seen Madalena in your travels. So that's why I want to go over a recap now to give you all the information and maybe you can help solve this case. So the last official sighting of Madalena Kojakari was on November 21st, 2022, when she was seen getting off the school bus near her house, located at 18413 Victoria Bay Drive in Cornelius, North Carolina. Madalena is white with brown hair and brown eyes, and at the time of her disappearance, she weighed approximately 90 pounds and stood 4 feet 10 inches tall. She was last seen wearing jeans, pink, purple, and white Adidas shoes, and a white t-shirt and jacket. If you have any information concerning the whereabouts of Madalena Kojakari, please contact the Cornelius Police Department at 704-892-7773. You can also contact your local FBI office or you can submit a tip online at tips.fbi.gov. And as for me, I'm going to keep Madalena in my thoughts and prayers. I'm really hoping for a safe return, but at minimum, I want to know that she's safe and being well taken care of. And ultimately, I want to know what happened. I want to know how we came to this place and why we are where we are today. So I'm going to keep up on this case and watch the developments. As I said earlier, if anything new comes out, I'll be sure to update you guys. But as always, I appreciate you joining me here. Stay safe out there and I'll see you next week.